seminar today on EEG waveforms, the building blocks of sleep stages. My name is Franco Volio and I am the Sleep and Neurology Education Manager with Natives Medical. I will be hosting today's session. We are very happy to have a special guest speaker and presenter today, Dr. Richard Rosenberg. In a moment, I will be introducing him. But before we do, I would like to go over some items first. Uh, if you are experiencing any issues hearing this session, there is a teleconference op option where you can listen to the session via your telephone or speakerphone. The call-in numbers for this option should be available in the emails you received from WebEx. Just a minute ago, I showed you a video demonstrating how to interact with us during the session. If you look on your toolbars or tabs, you should see a chat tab or toolbar and as well as a, a Q&A or question and answer. During the session, if you have anything that you want to communicate, you can use the chat mechanism and that will that message will come to me. And if you have any questions that you'd like to you'd like to submit at the end of the session, you can use the Q and A and I will be moderating the questions as well as the chat throughout so that Dr. Rosenberg can focus his attention on the presentation. At this point I would like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Rosenberg received his Ph.D. in 1980 from the University of Chicago, where he worked in the laboratory of Dr. Alan Reichestaffen. After a postdoctoral fellowship at Argonne National Laboratory, he served as co-director of the University of Chicago Sleep Center and then director of the Evanston Hospital Sleep Center from 1987 to 2003. He was a member of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Board of Directors from 1999 to 2003. He joined the AASM staff in 2003 and worked with the Education, Accreditation, and Standards of Practice Committees. He is now Director of Professional Education and Training at the AASM. And so at this point, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Dr. Rosenberg. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. and I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, speaking to all of you. Um, today we'll be talking about EEG waveforms, which is, uh, as I've noted, the building blocks of sleep stages. Uh, and for some of you this may seem very basic, and in a lot of ways it is very basic, but it's one of those things that uh, is said that uh, you can learn the basics in a week or two, uh, but learning the subtleties takes a lifetime. So. Uh, no matter what level of experience you're at, uh, I think this may be helpful in getting you to think about uh, what it is that we do uh, here in the field of sleep medicine. And one of the more important things that we do is to try and make sense of the uh, sleep studies that are presented to us. Uh, and one of the most important signals that we're looking at during a, a sleep study is the EEG. Uh, and here I have an example here, which to the untrained eye looks like a bunch of squiggles. Uh, these used to be recorded on, on paper uh, with little pens that moved up and down, uh, and uh, we were uh, tasked with having to, to try and interpret them. Uh, but now for most people, these are digital signals, uh, which gives us a lot of opportunity for modifying the signals and making things a little easier to uh, interpret as we go along. So what I would like to present to you is uh, a, a methodology for making sense of these sleep squiggles uh, using uh, elements of the waveform. And we're going to focus on four different things here. We're going to focus on amplitude, frequency, wave shape, and distribution. And if you read carefully through the ASM scoring manual, and, and virtually all of this talk will be based on the scoring manual, You'll find at various points along the way uh, little gray boxes that have definitions of waveforms. And what I've tried to do is to pull these uh, descriptions out and then uh, uh, amplify uh, them and, and uh, get into some of the details on, on them uh, to make using them a, a little more uh, accessible. So we'll start with amplitude, uh, which is very simply uh, the distance between the uppermost part of the waveform and the lowermost part. And this is typically measured in microvolts. Uh, the signals that come off the brain are very small in amplitude, and they're amplified uh, to a great extent in order to make them visible to us. Um, and uh, they're typically very easily measured uh, using most of the systems that are available today. Now, this goes way back to the time when uh, EEG required the use of vacuum tubes and grids uh, in order to do the amplification. 
but at that time, as a matter of convention, uh, a negative waveform went up and a positive waveform went down. And a lot of what we see on our digital representations of EEG are based on these old vacuum tube systems. Uh, a lot of the terminology and a, and a lot of the conventions are, are well established from the 1930s and 1940s. But as I say, our digital systems uh, allow us to do some new things. And one of these is to, to measure the voltage uh, automatically using uh, the systems that are available today. So uh, in measuring the amplitude of this waveform, uh, which happens to be a K-complex, and it's recorded from the frontal EEG channels, uh, we can see that indicated over here, uh, and simply putting a cursor uh, from the computer system on that uh, highest level, the, the peak level, so this would actually be the, the negative peak here uh, that we see here, and then putting a, a second cursor at the lowest level of the waveform, which would be, be this port here, and this is actually the most positive part uh, of the EEG wave. And then, uh, sort of almost magically, uh, the system provides a, a voltage level for us. So this particular K-complex happens to be 542.48 microvolts high. And as we go through this process of evaluating these waveforms, we'll find that some of these waveforms uh, notably uh, slow wave activity, are defined based on the amplitude of the signal. So having a, a reliable measure of the amplitude is an important part of evaluating the EEG waveform. Uh, the next element of the waveform that we'll focus on is frequency. And this can be defined in, in two waves. The frequency is simply the number of waves in a given time period. And typically, it's expressed in waves per second. And this is named after Heinrich Hertz. So uh, it's called Hertz. And, and as I say, there are two ways to, to measure the frequency. One way for faster waveforms, where there are multiple waves within uh, what one second interval, is simply to count the number of waves. And, and this will be done by simply counting the number of peaks. Uh, but the second way to measure the duration of the waveform and to calculate the frequency uh, is simply to measure how long the waveform lasts. And the frequency is then defined as the inverse of the duration, or 1 divided by the duration. So here's an example of a faster waveform. Uh, this happens to be alpha rhythm. Uh, and uh, you can see that the peaks are very easy to uh, distinguish. Um, this green arrow here uh, indicates a one second line. Uh, so we can measure the number of peaks between this point here at the beginning of the second and this point here at the end of the second. And we find that there are 12 peaks that we can identify in this waveform. So this gives us a measure of frequency, and this waveform is at 12 hertz. But for slower waveforms, uh, it's easier to measure the duration of the waveform. And uh, again, with our electronic systems, this is relatively easy to do. So we use the same thing as we did for measuring amplitude. We put a cursor at the beginning, which is here. And then we put a cursor at the end, which is here. And then our system provides us with the duration of the signal. Uh, it provides us with the frequency, which is the 1 over the duration of the signal, or the inverse of the signal. And this waveform happens to be at 0.81 hertz. So what that means is 0.8 waveforms occur in one second. And for example, if we had a, a 10 second interval and multiple instances of this very same waveform, we find that there were eight of them uh, that fit into a 10 second window. So uh, the third element that we're going to be looking at is the uh, wave shape. And uh, there are vague description of what the wave shape actually is. But the two most common things that you're going to see in terms of EEG waveforms are the smooth sinusoidal and regular waveform, uh, shown here on the left, versus the sharp and irregular waveform, shown here on the right. So by uh, smooth, we mean that there's no sharp peak here at the tops or the bottoms of the waveforms, although at times this looks a little sharp. Really, if it were stretched out, it would be nice and smooth. 
Uh, sinusoidal is a little bit of math, uh, a little geometry. Uh, you don't actually have to do any calculations to know that sinusoidal just means that there's a regular time of going up and a regular time of going down, and it looks very smooth and regular just like this. And by regular, we mean that if we look at each of these individual waveforms and compare them one to another, they all look fairly much the same. So these are all uh, kind of sharp, uh, sorry, smoother waveforms here and, and down here, and uh, a particular waveform at this end looks pretty much the same as a waveform at that end. And we contrast that to this waveform here on the right, where there are some slower waveforms here, some faster waveforms here, some very fast waveforms here, and the whole thing looks very irregular, and it's very hard to see what's going on uh, from uh, one point in the waveform to another. So again, smooth and sinusoidal on this side, sharp and irregular on the other side. And then the final element that we're going to be looking at is the distribution of the waveform. And, and this is where the waveform comes from uh, on, on the surface of the brain. And uh, we're using this montage system that we're using, this is called a referential montage, where we have electrodes that are connected to the same reference. So the grid one is, a, is the active electrode, and that's different in each of these three channels, F4 here, C4 here, and O2 here. Whereas the grid 2 input is M1, the left-sided mastoid input, and that's the same in all of these uh, channels. So using this type of methodology, we can determine what the source of the, the signal is by looking at the amplitude. And again, the amplitude is measured from the peak or the uppermost point to the lowermost point. And we can see that this waveform here has a peak here and a lower point here. And that this amplitude, the difference between this point and this point, is highest in this frontal channel. It's lower here in this central channel. The difference between the highest and the lowest is, is much less. And then there's virtually no difference here in the occipital channel. So what that leads us to, make, to, to uh, conclude is that this waveform here, which is another K-complex, is maximal in amplitude. It's largest in amplitude here in this frontal EEG channel. That means it's a frontal waveform with highest amplitude in the F4M1 channel. So this gives us an indication of where the activity is coming from, and we'll see that that plays into some of our uh, definitions of, of waveforms as we go along. So uh, as we read through the uh, Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, scoring manual, uh, the first waveform definition that we encounter uh, is associated with wakefulness, and uh, it's the alpha rhythm. This is something uh, discovered in 1928 by Hans Berger, uh, and it's a, a waveform that can be recorded uh, when patients are relaxed with their eyes closed. So here's the definition that we're going to work from here. This comes from the Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, scoring manual. Uh, alpha rhythm activity is trains of sinusoidal 8 to 13 hertz activity recorded over the occipital area with eye closure attenuating with eye opening. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to one of the words in this definition, which is attenuating. And that just simply means decreasing in amplitude. Uh, so the amplitude decreases at time the amplitude will go down to zero. Uh, but what we need to define alpha rhythm activity is just this attenuation, this decrease in amplitude when the patients are asked to open their eyes. So in my scheme for analyzing these waveforms is to divide the definition into these four elements, the amplitude, frequency, wave shape, and distribution. So determining the amplitude of alpha rhythm activity, uh, we simply find that it's attenuated with eye opening. So this means that in order to define the alpha the alpha rhythm, we have to have at least a portion of the recording where we ask the patient to open and close their eyes. And this is typically done at the beginning of the recording during the biological calibration. The frequency of the activity is 8 to 13 hertz. And with a faster waveform, such as alpha rhythm, 
will simply be counting the peaks in a one second interval uh, to determine the frequency. Uh, the wave shape is defined as sinusoidal. Uh, that's here in our definition. Uh, that means it's going to be smooth and regular, so the beginning waveform is going to be pretty much the same as the ending waveform. All of the waveforms in between are going to be pretty much the same. And then finally, uh, the distribution is going to be mainly occipital. So in our typical recording, our referential montage, we're going to see the highest amplitude in the occipital area of the brain. Now, there are some cases where that's not uh, applicable. So some patients will have alpha rhythm activity that projects further forward into the mastoid electrodes. And that will mean, uh, with our referential montage using our differential amplifiers, that there are patients where the alpha rhythm activity may be larger in the frontal or central uh, EEG channel. Uh, but for the most part, the alpha rhythm is going to be seen best in our occipital recording. And I also want to mention that uh, in the literature it says that approximately 10 to 15 percent of patients have no alpha rhythm or very low alpha rhythm. And uh, actually, in my experience, that isn't the case. It's probably a, a much smaller percentage of patients who have no alpha rhythm. Uh, but that is a possibility, and there are special rules for scoring uh, sleep stages uh, for patients who do not generate alpha rhythm activity. So let's look at a few sample recordings. Uh, here's one that demonstrates the uh, amplitude change that needs to be demonstrated for uh, scoring of alpha rhythm activity. So here we have the technologist asking the patient to open their eyes here and close their eyes here. And we can see this nice alpha rhythm activity here in the occipital channel. Uh, we see it here uh, when the patient closes their eyes again. But in the middle part here, there's very little alpha rhythm activity. So the amplitude of this signal has gone down dramatically. If we uh, blow this up, increase the, the display gain, and uh, look at it very carefully, we may find that there are still some waveforms in that 8 to 13 hertz range. But these are attenuated. These are of much smaller amplitude uh, with the patient opening and closing their eyes. Now, we do see some alpha frequency activity here in the central and frontal channels. And as I say, that may be because the source of the activity is close to these mastoid electrodes, and that's picking up this activity uh, and displaying it in these two channels. Another useful thing to note uh, is the presence of eye movement artifact uh, here in the frontal channel. So uh, when the patient opens his eyes, uh, the uh, eyeball rotates downward, uh, and that causes an upward deflection here in the uh, frontal EEG channel. And then when the patient closes their eyes, the eyeballs rotate up, and that causes a, another artifact here. So this gives us a, a good indication of when the eye opening and eye closing occurs, and that helps us identify the attenuation period uh, here in the center of this recording. So these waveforms would meet the criteria for alpha rhythm activity in that the amplitude of the signal decreases dramatically during this period with the patient's eyes open. So I, again, measuring the frequency, uh, we simply take a portion of the recording. We look at one second of the recording and count the number of waveforms. So here these green lines indicate one second. They're one second apart. Here we're looking at just the occipital EEG channel. Uh, we've increased the display gain, and we've increased the, the window size so that uh, it, this uh, window contains only a, a less than two seconds. And then we simply count the number of waveforms. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine waves per second. Nine falls nicely in between eight and 13. This is another bit of math that we have to perform in the service of sleep medicine. Uh, so we've got a nice waveform with the proper frequency of between eight and 13 hertz. So this also meets criteria uh, for alpha rhythm activity. And next we need to look at the wave shape. And uh, as I've mentioned, to, to have a regular and sinusoidal waveform, 
uh, the ways at the beginning have to look pretty much the same as the ways at the end. And we have to generalize a little bit here. The waves are not going to be absolutely identical to each other. Uh, that simply doesn't happen in a, in a physiologic system. But, uh, you know, in general, this waveform here looks pretty much the same as this waveform here. So the width of it, which is the duration uh, and indicates a, a measure of the frequency, is pretty much the same here at the beginning at the end. There are some little blips here, some little faster frequency waveforms that pop up. But in general, this is a pretty regular waveform for a physiological signal, uh, and then therefore meets our, our criteria for the, the shape of the waveform. It is sinusoidal uh, and regular. And then our final uh, element that we're going to be looking at is the distribution. And again, in our referential montage, it's the amplitude of the signal uh, that indicates the source. So the highest amplitude of this alpha rhythm activity is here in the occipital channel. You can see it's nice, big, robust, and pretty easy to see. And in this patient, in the, the central and frontal leads, we're seeing much more mixed frequency activity. We're seeing some beta waves, some little faster frequency activity here, some sharper waveforms. So much less uh, regularity and much lower amplitude in the, the frontal and central EEG channels here and here. And so this leads us to conclude that the activity we're seeing here in the occipital channel uh, is, in fact, alpha rhythm activity. So we've met these four criteria, the, the amplitude, uh, the frequency, the wave shape, and the distribution. Uh, and this allows us to define alpha rhythm activity uh, with some pretty good uh, reliability. Our next waveform isn't really a waveform. Uh, it, it's sort of what's left over uh, in the EEG recording when we've defined everything else. And uh, this is low amplitude mixed frequency EEG. So the only thing we have in our definition uh, from the scoring uh, manual is that it is low amplitude, that it's 4 to 7 hertz predominantly. And that's the only information that we're given. So here we have low amplitude. Predominantly 4 to 7 hertz means that we can have other frequencies uh, mixing in. Uh, sometimes you'll see faster frequencies uh, even up into the beta uh, range. And sometimes you'll see slower frequencies mixed in as well. Uh, the wave shape is not specified, and it it's, uh, tends to be irregular and uh, non-sinusoidal. And the distribution is not specified because this low amplitude mixed frequency EEG uh, tends to be recorded in all of the EEG channels. And here's an example of this. Uh, this gives you the amplitude and the frequency. Uh, the amplitude is that it's the background activity. It's, it's what we see going on in the EEG in between the, the other waveforms. Uh, once the alpha rhythm activity uh, goes away, this is the kind of activity that we will see. We'll see it very prominently during uh, stage N1 sleep. Uh, we'll also see it in between the spindles and K complexes of stage N2 sleep. And this is also the EEG pattern that we'll see during stage R sleep. So it's kind of random, um, not much in terms of reliability. Uh, not much difference between the, the frontal channel and the occipital channel. They're all pretty much the same. You can see some sharper waveforms, a few slower waveforms. It's, it's just mixed in its background activity, and it's kind of blah. Next, we move on to the vertex wave. Uh, and these really become important only in patients uh, who do not generate alpha rhythm activity, because the vertex wave can signal uh, the onset of sleep. Uh, the definition uh, is that they are sharply contoured waves with a duration of less than 0.5 seconds. And what that means is that the frequency is greater than 2 hertz. So 0.5 seconds is a duration. 1 divided by uh, 0.5 leads to a frequency of 2 hertz. So we measure our, our frequency here by counting the, by looking at the duration. So these are equivalent things. A, a duration less than half a hertz is the same as a frequency of 2 hertz or more. Uh, the distribution is that they're maximal over the central region. So that's here in our definition. And then once again here in our four elements that we're looking at, that it's 
maximal in the central region of the EEG. And then uh, the only amplitude criteria is that it's distinguishable from background activity. So that background activity that we see is the uh, low amplitude mixed frequency EG, and the vertex wave should pop out of that. It should be distinguishable from that. It should look different from that background activity. So here's an example here. Uh, this provides the amplitude, uh, frequency, and wave shape. Uh, so the amplitude is that it sticks out of the background. So here's the amplitude of the background activity, uh, which is very small in comparison with this waveform, which has a much higher amplitude and kind of sticks out from the background. Now the frequency we measure by looking at the duration. So the duration has to be less than half a second. So there's the duration of our waveform there. And since these green lines are one second apart, half of that would be here more or less, maybe here. So uh, this duration here is, is obviously less than this half a second here, so it meets that criteria for duration and frequency. And then the wave shape is that it is a sharply contoured wave. So uh, we can see that this part of the waveform here is, is rather sharp. Um, sharp uh, is defined classically by electroencephalographers as something that would hurt if you sat on it. So uh, looking at this waveform, even at this uh, expanded view, this does look like something that would hurt uh, or you to uh, sit on it. So sharply contoured, uh, meeting the duration, which is the frequency requirement, uh, and uh, meeting the amplitude requirement in that it, it sticks out from the background. And now let's look at the, the distribution of this vertex wave. And here we have the frontal channel, the central channel, and the occipital channel. Again, the distribution, the, the source of the signal, is defined by the amplitude. And for this particular waveform here, the amplitude in the central channel uh, looks like it's higher there than it is here in the frontal channel. And then uh, virtually nothing here in the occipital channel for this waveform. So this would lead us to conclude that the, the activity is coming from the central area of the, the brain surface of the brain, less amplitude in the frontal channel, more amplitude in the central channel, means that the distribution is more central. Uh, so this would meet all of our four criteria for vertex wave. It's got the sharp contour, the proper duration. Uh, it sticks out from the background, and the distribution is uh, somewhat higher here in the central region uh, than in the other parts of the EEG. Okay, now we come to a, a waveform that's very important in the definition of stage two sleep. Um, and for a time I was a participant on the sleep L uh, listserv, uh, but I, I eventually dropped off in part due to the uh, three-month-long discussion of what was the origin of the term K-complex. And after three months of emails going back and forth and lots of discussion, the conclusion was that no one knew what the source of the term K-complex is. But it's a waveform that we have a, a definition for uh, that comes from the uh, Academy, Sleep, uh, Academy of Sleep Medicine Scoring Annual. Excuse me. So the, the definition is that it is a well-delineated negative sharp wave immediately followed by a positive component standing out from the background EEG with a duration of greater than 0.5 seconds, usually maximal in amplitude when recorded using frontal derivations. So using our four elements, uh, the amplitude, once again, we just have to say that it stands out from the background EEG. There's no numerical value that we have to meet uh, for a, a K-complex. When it says the duration is greater than or equal to half a second, that means that the frequency is 2 hertz or less. So th this is going to be a very slow waveform, less than 2 hertz. There's no uh, uh, minimum value. There's, there's no lowest frequency that it could have. Uh, it can go all the way down to 0.1 hertz if, if you're willing to to give that kind of leeway to this waveform. But it can be uh, no faster 
uh, than 2 hertz. So the duration has to be 0.5 seconds or more. Anything smaller just does not meet the, the criteria for scoring of a K-complex. Now, the wave shape for a K-complex is very helpful. Uh, it's a negative sharp wave followed by a positive component. And as you remember, uh, negative is up, so the waveform has to go up first, and that's followed by a uh, positive component, a downward component, uh, that goes below the zero line. So these two elements have to be present, uh, the sharp negative waveform followed by the positive component. And then uh, the distribution is maximal recorded using frontal derivation. So it has to be biggest uh, in the frontal EEG channel. So uh, I want to point out a few things uh, in this definition that, that make the scoring uh, difficult at time and, and lead to this uh, conclusion that the subtleties take a lifetime. Uh, well delineated has no numerical value. I mean, it's, it says it should look clear and, and easily determine that it's sharp, but well delineated is really pretty vague in terms of the definition for a waveform. Um, standing out from the background EEG has no numerical value. So uh, it means that we should see it, but sometimes what's defined as standing out for one person is, is very different from what another person would define as standing out. So we'll look at some examples that fall on the borderline. And then we also have this vague vagueness in the definition by the word usually. So it says it's usually maximal in amplitude in the frontal derivations. If we see something that meets all the other criteria but it's maximal in the occipital derivation, would we call that a K-complex? And I think as you derive more experience with recording EEG, you would say no, that, that something that's occipital would not meet our criteria uh, for a K-complex. We'd call that some other kind of waveform. If it were more prominent in the central channel, that's a little different. Maybe that would be acceptable as a K-complex. Uh, but this idea that it's usually maximal recording frontal derivations doesn't really provide the kind of precision of definition uh, that we, we might want to have in, in our EEG waveform definitions. So here's an example uh, where we're trying to define the amplitude. and as I showed you earlier, we can actually measure the amplitude using our recording system here and come out with a very precise number uh, accurate to two decimal points. So this waveform is 127.47 microvolts, and we, we can measure how, what the amplitude of the signal is. But that's not really part of the K-complex definition. Uh, the definition requires that it sticks out from the background. So here's our background activity here. And we can see that in this case, this K-complex is pretty obviously sticking out from the background. It's something that's not part of the routine EEG here as we uh, scan along this line of, of EEG tracing. So this stuff over here would be our low amplitude mixed frequency EEG. And that's clearly distinguishable from this uh, activity that we see here. So the amplitude here meeting our criteria for sticking out from the background. Uh, the next thing we look at is the, the duration uh, in order to provide a measure of the frequency. Uh, and again, as I showed uh, earlier, you, you can simply put your cursor at the beginning of the waveform and then uh, here again at the end of the waveform. And, and the system will provide all of the data that you need. So in this case, the duration is uh, 1,290 milliseconds, uh, leading to uh, a frequency of uh, 0.78 hertz. Now this system interestingly provides a zero crossing frequency measure. Uh, and that's really a good way to determine frequency in these slower waveforms, which is to say that, that you uh, determine where the zero voltage mark is. Uh, and in some cases we can turn that on as a grid line and turn it off uh, in order to see where it is. But in this case it's approximately here. And we can see that our K-complex begins its sharp negative component from the zero point at about this red marker here. And then it takes off in a negative duration and has a sharp peak. And then it has this positive component that comes down here. So it does cross the zero line here. And then once again, the positive component uh, completes and the zero point is over here uh, at this blue line. 
So we have this nice wave shape here with this negative component followed by this positive component, uh, and that uh, meets our criteria for the definition of, of a K-complex. So we, we know we're on the right track in, in defining this waveform. And then finally, we can look at the distribution. Uh, and here we have our three channels, once again, that are required by the scoring manual. And so the, the distribution is determined by the amplitude and our signal here in the frontal channels. The amplitude is clearly higher than our signal here in the, the central channel. And again, not much in the occipital channel. So once again, our conclusion for this waveform is that the amplitude is highest here uh, so that this would be a, a frontally per, uh, predominant waveform uh, and would there, uh, therefore may be, uh, meet our criteria for scoring of a K-complex. Now, one of the things that sometimes complicates our uh, analysis of the amplitude of the K-complex, uh, because it is in the frontal channel, is that at times we may have our, our display gain settings uh, so high that the frontal channel will, will maximize out. And so you'll see a flat part of the frontal EG recording uh, before the front, the uh, positive component starts. And what that means is that, that we're blocking off the top part of the signal. We have to imagine the signal going up and, and hitting its uh, sharp peak uh, approximately here. So this would mean that the gain would actually be this, Whereas when we're looking at the display, we'd only see that the topmost portion is here. So you have to be careful about that with the frontal EEG recording, uh, not to be uh, blocking off the channel and, and giving it, uh, an inaccurate uh, estimation of what the amplitude is. So as I mentioned, uh, a lot of our definitions of, of K-complexes are not very precise, and they have things like usually and sticking out from the background. Uh, and so as we read through our EEG recordings, we're going to find some waveforms that really may or may not meet our criteria for, for definition as a K-complex. And here we see a waveform uh, that has some faster frequencies riding across it. It does have a, an initial negative component, but uh, that component really isn't very sharp. The positive component is a little better. That's this part here. Uh, but really, you know, can you determine that this part here is sharp or not sharp? I don't think it really meets our criteria of uh, should we happen to sit on it, it would hurt. And then we see a, a lower voltage uh, example of the same thing here in, in the central and, and less in the, the occipital. So when we look at our four parameters, you know, it doesn't really have the proper wave shape. It does have the proper frequency, so it's clearly more than half a second in duration. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that wave shape, and it does have the, the appropriate uh, distribution across the scalp and that it's highest here in the frontal channel. Uh, uh, but again, you know, looking at this waveform, I, I'm not sure that, that I would define this as a, as a good uh, K-complex, uh, whereas other people looking at this might say, well, it does stick out from the background, have the appropriate uh, frequency and the appropriate distribution, maybe I would call that as a K-complex. That, that illustrates some of the, uh, the problems we have in, in the vagueness of the, the definitions of these waveforms. And then here we have a waveform that may or may not stick out from the background. It, it does have the nice uh, wave shape here, a little sharper waveform here, uh, and, and the appropriate duration and again, the appropriate distribution, but uh, whether that, that sticks out from the background of this kind of activity, which is clearly not a K-complex, the amplitude of the signal isn't really much different from that. And so that's why I call this uh, a K-complex maybe when it grows up uh, and increases in amplitude. I don't know if I'd use this as the start of, of stage two sleep as a, as a definition of a waveform. So now we turn to spindles, and the definition of, of spindles adds uh, one more layer of complexity. Uh, spindles are distinct waves. Again, we have our very vague uh, indicator of amplitude with a frequency of 11 to 16 hertz, most commonly between 12 and 14 hertz. And then it has a train that has a duration of more than half a second. So uh, we'll look at this in some detail, but it, it again, adds a, another layer of specificity. Uh, to the definition. 
Here, usually maximal in amplitude using central derivations. And uh, in the case of fleece spindles, there are many examples where uh, the maximal amplitude is centrally and, and not uh, frontally. And other examples where it's more frontal rather than central. We'll, we'll take a look at some of these. So breaking this out into our four elements, uh, again, distinct waves, not much uh, guidance in terms of amplitude. Uh, frequency between 11 and 16 hertz with the train, the duration of the spindle train having to be five second, uh, half a second or more. Wave shape not specified, but uh, when you look at spindles, you see that they're mostly very sinusoidal. And then again, distribution maximal recording the, the central derivations. So here's a very nice example of a sleep spindle. Here's the central derivation, uh, C4M1. And we can see that the background activity looks like this and this. And this particular waveform sticks out from the background very nicely, not so much because of its amplitude being very different, but because of the, the continuity, uh, the regularity of the waveforms, uh, and the visually uh, distinct uh, for this portion uh, of the recording. Measuring the frequency, once again, we, we put our one second marker out. Uh, and then simply count the number of waveforms. Uh, and this actually comes closer to, to 12 waveforms when we count the peaks. So uh, this is a, a frequency of 12 hertz. And then the train duration, uh, we can measure this duration using a, a cursor here at the beginning and again at the end. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so the duration here is 835 milliseconds. And then the distribution. So here's our uniquely looking waveform of, of sleep spindle here. It's reflected here in the frontal channel. It's reflected here in the occipital channel. But the amplitude is lower uh, in these other channels and, and higher here in the central channel. So we conclude that this is a waveform that is centrally predominant. As I mentioned, uh, very frequently you'll see frontal uh, sleep spindles. And here's a nice example of that, where the F4M1 channel has higher amplitude uh, than the central channel. And yet, when we look at all the other aspects of this waveform, uh, it does have the proper frequency and the, the train duration uh, and the distinctness, uh, so that I think most people would agree that this is clearly a sleep spindle, uh, but it's highest in amplitude in the, the frontal channel. And again, we'll, we'll get to the borderlines of, of these waveforms uh, very frequently. Uh, here we can see the faster frequencies are present here in, in this particular part of the waveform. Uh, but really, is it distinct from the background activity? I mean, there's some activity in faster frequency over here. Uh, there's maybe a little more activity over here. So this amplitude requirement is really very critical to the definition of the sleep spindle. And the amplitude only requirement only requires that it be distinct from the other waveforms uh, in, in the EEG. So now we come to the waveform that, that has the most um, mathematical precision in, in terms of definition, and yet leads to the most confusion uh, among sleep scorers. And uh, when we get to sleep state scoring, we'll find that scoring uh, differentiation between stage N2 and stage N3 is perhaps the most difficult distinction to make uh, for sleep scores and has the least reliability from score to score. Uh, but here we have three very precisely defined aspects of the uh, slow wave activity. Uh, one is that the frequency is 0 0.5 to 2 hertz, so that's very easy to determine. Uh, two, that the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude is greater than 75 microvolts. And three, that the amplitude measurement should be taken over the frontal region. Now, this does not require that the, the amplitude be highest in the frontal region, but typically it is for slow wave activity, and that's led to the requirement for measurement of the amplitude over the frontal region. So for those of you who still have not updated to the 2007 uh, scoring requirement, the frontal EEG channel is now required. And the reason it's required is for the measurement of amplitude of slow wave activity. 
So looking at our four elements, amplitude greater than 75 microvolts, frequency of 0 0.5 to 2 hertz, which corresponds to a duration of 0 0.5 to 2 seconds. Nothing said about the wave shape, and we'll get back to the importance of this in a few minutes. And finally, distribution measured over the frontal region with no indication of where the highest amplitude is or where the source of the EEG activity needs to be. So measuring the amplitude, we used the same thing we did for the, the K complex. We put our cursor here at the, at the peak level, the, the most negative part of the waveform, and then a cursor here at the most positive part, and we get our amplitude of 317.78 microvolts. Uh, which is, um, at this level of precision, you can, you can use it for a few slow waves to get a good idea of what's happening. But I think that most scores use the uh, horizontal amplitude markers as a better measure. And you notice that these are set at minus 37.5 and plus 37.5 microvolts. So the difference between these two lines is 75 microvolts. So when scoring slow wave activity, all we need to see is that the amplitude is higher than this point, more negative here, and more positive than this point, and there we've met our requirements that the amplitude of the signal is greater than 75 microvolts. So these horizontal markers are very useful and decrease the amount of time necessary uh, to measure amplitude. Uh, next we look at frequency, and, and again we're using that zero crossing kind of method uh, here, putting a marker when the beginning of the waveform uh, crosses the zero point. It crosses the zero point again here, and then we have the end of the waveform here when the positive part ends and it comes back to zero. Uh, this leads us to a duration of 1,625 milliseconds and a frequency of 0 0.62 hertz. So uh, 0 0.5 to 2 hertz as, is our frequency range. And we can see that this waveform uh, meets this frequency range very easily. Now, one of the mistakes that many people make in terms of evaluating the duration of a slow wave is to look at only half of the wave. Uh, it's important to remember that the wave uh, has to follow a full cycle. So the first half of the cycle uh, can be defined using the zero crossing method as the time it takes to go negative and then back to zero. So here's the zero point here. We can see that this waveform has taken this amount of time to go to its most negative value here and then back to zero. So that's one half cycle of the wave. But that's not the duration of the wave. The wave includes negative and positive components. So here's the positive half wave where the wave becomes more and more positive here, reaches its most positive point here and then gets back to zero here. So uh, again, uh, thinking back to our mathematics, here's a full cycle of the waveform. It's a, a negative part and a positive part. So the duration has to include both of those parts. Some people who score only half of the part may say, oh no, this waveform is, is too fast. It doesn't meet the duration requirement. But it's important to use both halves of the waveform uh, when measuring the duration and therefore calculating the frequency of zero point. 62 hertz. And then finally, the, the distribution of slow wave activity we mentioned is measured in the frontal channel. You can see our horizontal markers are here in the frontal channel and allows us to make these amplitude measurements quickly and easily as it increases and decreases over these horizontal wave uh, uh, markers. Um, so it's a little less amplitude here in the, in the central channel and not much amplitude here in the occipital channel. So the distribution here is more frontal, uh, but this is not necessary for the definition of slow waves. The slow waves need only be measured as reaching that 75 microvolt criteria uh, here in the frontal EEG channel. So remember the wave shape is not defined. Uh, but the wave must, must meet the amplitude and frequency requirements. And uh, the waves are to be measured over the frontal region, but the distribution is not defined. Now, one of the questions I get very frequently at the Academy is, is a K-complex a slow wave? And 
looking at the uh, duration uh, and the amplitude, if those criteria are met by a K-complex, even if the initial part of the waveform is sharply negative, K-complexes can meet the criteria for slow waves. So in calculating the, the number and duration of slow waves for the scoring of stage M3 sleep, uh, it's important to include any of the waves that meet these objective criteria, these four elements of the waveform. And uh, a proper K-complex can fit these uh, requirements. Now what, we'll, we'll get back to uh, what requirements it may not fit so that it's a K-complex but not a slow wave in just a few minutes. So let's look at our four elements and some waveforms that may be confused. Uh, one of the waveforms that's occasionally confused with alpha rhythms is spindle activity. Um, and the reason for that is that there's some overlap in terms of the frequency. So uh, alpha rhythm is 8 to 13 hertz. Sleep spindle activity 11 to 16 hertz. So something between 13 and 16 hertz could meet criteria for both waveforms. Uh, but then we have to look at some of the other elements and some of the things that give us a little more confidence uh, about what waveform we're looking at. So alpha rhythm is maximal in the occipital channel. That's this channel back here. Uh, it's typically of a longer duration than the sleep spindle. It typically has some waxing and waning of amplitude. It increases and decreases. Um, and again, we're seeing it with the patient with their eyes closed. If we ask them to open their eyes during the biological calibration, uh, we'll see an attenuation of this. This gives us a way of identifying the waveform early on, and then later in the recording we can come back and try and match things up with what we've seen during the biological calibration. Spindle activity, on the other hand, tends to be briefer. Uh, the usual uh, distribution is that it's maximal centrally, and here we can see there's nothing occipital during the time when we have this sleep spindle. Uh, we do have these frontal uh, sleep spindles, uh, the minimum duration is half a second. Uh, occasionally, you'll see sleep spindles that last three or maybe even five seconds. Uh, the duration of the spindle may be increased uh, if the patient is taking benzodiazepines. There are some uh, developmental disorders that are associated with what's called hyperspindling. Uh, but for the most part, the spindles are going to be much briefer in duration and won't occur in the occipital channel very prominently and could be easily distinguished from alpha rhythm activity. Uh, other waveforms that might be confused are vertex waves and K-complexes. Uh, but here, actually, we have a, a good way of distinguishing between the two, in that the frequency bands do not overlap at all. So the vertex wave is going to be greater than 2 hertz, which means that the duration is going to be less than half a hertz. And the K-complex is going to be less than 2 hertz, which means the duration is more uh, than half a second. Uh, the wave shape, uh, sharply contoured vertex wave, and that very distinctive waveform for the K-complex where it's a sharp negative uh, followed by a positive. And then we can also distinguish these to some extent because the vertex waves are central and the K-complexes are frontal. So here's an example of this. We have this nice sharp vertex wave, uh, higher in amplitude here in the central channel. We have the much longer K-complex here, uh, much higher in the frontal channel. So looking at our definitions of the, of the waveforms and, and looking at the definition of the K-complex, uh, we can see that in terms of frequency, it only has uh, a, uh, a limit on one side. So that the duration can be actually quite long. And this allows for the possibility that a, a K-complex that lasts more than two seconds uh, would not meet criteria for a slow wave uh, because the slow wave has to be between 0.5 and 2 hertz. Uh, so that's one instance where you could have a K-complex that does not meet criteria uh, for slow wave activity. Uh, but for the most part, in the scoring of slow waves, I think we'll find that that K-complexes do meet the criteria uh, and should be included as slow-wave activity. So uh, I'd like to end on a, a slightly theoretical note, which is um, to include waveform identification in uh, the context of learning theory. 
And in learning theory, uh, there are two means for identifying categories. In other words, we're putting things that we see with our eyes into one category or another. In other words, dogs versus cats or uh, balloons versus basketballs. Uh, we have rules for, for distinguishing between these two things. Uh, but we also learn by looking at various examples and having people correct us. So, uh, for example, looking at a, a pug and a Great Dane, uh, it might be difficult at first to say that these are both uh, in the category of dogness. Uh, but eventually, after seeing enough examples of, of dogs in between these two extremes, uh, one can get a good picture of what's going on and uh, quickly and easily identify which category things go into. So in teaching sleep scoring, it's important to start with the rules. And the rules are based on the definitions from the ASM manual for scoring. So you really can't become a, a, an accomplished scorer without spending some quality time with the manual. Uh, looking through it, uh, memorizing the definitions, and looking at some of the examples of things uh, to get a good idea of where to start from. But the subtleties of the lifetime uh, of evaluating EEG and, and scoring sleep stages uh, come from uh, looking at examples of things. And subjects differ, differ quite a bit. You may see some abnormal EEGs. Uh, you may see some patients who have uh, very distinctive kinds of waveforms and uh, have, uh, differences in, in alpha rhythm activity and things like that. Uh, so uh, it's important to gain experience with a large number of waveforms uh, in order to get um, an increased amount of confidence in, in, in terms of your scoring. But once these rules and these examples are, are ingrained, uh, I'll use the old uh, psychology term of gestalt, that the experienced scorer gets a good gestalt of what uh, each of the sleep stages are to be. And using a digital recording system with a keypad, it's, it becomes more and more uh, simple to identify the categories of sleep stages and to score in a much more quick and easy kind of, of method uh, to do this. Um, there have been some studies of uh, fMRI studies of, of brain activity in new and, and uh, experienced scores, and in comparing the two, the new scores use their frontal lobes a lot. In other words, they're calling up the rules and, and making conclusions about things, whereas the experienced scores tend to use their occipital cortex. In other words, it's more of a visual recognition kind of thing, and the, uh, the scoring uh, decision comes along much more quickly. So. Uh, the last comment I'd like to make is that my favorite uh, scoring technologist, who uh, is now a practicing neurologist in the Chicago area, uh, frequently scored his sleep records with his headphones on, and Ozzy Osbourne uh, turned up to full volume, which is 11 on his uh, sound system. And he found that this allowed him to, to allow the flow of the recording to proceed and the accuracy of his scoring actually increased. Um, and so this, uh, I guess, Ozzy Osbourne deactivates the frontal lobes uh, and allows the occipital lobes to do the work. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, I hear you're back on the line, Franco. So Thank you very much. Uh, your last point there about Ozzy Osbourne sounds like a possible uh, a potential paper there, a thesis or something. <laughs> and maybe you can have that built into your scoring system so that it takes people on their headphones. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you very much. That was excellent. Uh, judging from the uh, the responses, the comments that I'm receiving right now, you are getting a loud virtual applause. Unfortunately, you can't hear that. But, uh, but yes, I am receiving a lot of very positive uh, comments. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, at this At this point, the doctor mentioned he will uh, take some questions. I'm going to give you a minute or so just to, to submit some questions. Dr. Rosenberg has also provided his email address in case you want to contact him directly. My email address is also there if you have any questions with respect to Native education or e-seminars in general. So if you are interested in finding out about other uh, educational opportunities, if you go to natives.com, go to the education link, clinical education, neurology seminars, and then once you're on that page, you can click where you, right here where you can download a copy of the e-seminar calendar. I'm going to 
start to submit a few questions here that I've received during the course of the presentation. First one is, are drug spindles more predominant in one channel than another? Um, that's a good question. I'm not really sure of the answer. Uh, I, I know I've seen drug spindles frontally and, and in other patients centrally. They may have something to do with the, uh, what medication is being used. So I, I really don't have a good answer for that. Okay. The Atlas of Sleep Medicine defines a K-complex that is monophasic or polyphasic slow wave. What does that mean, or can you elaborate? I know you talked about that in one of your last slides there. Yeah, I, it, that's a distinction that's, that's really not being used anymore. So uh, the, the scoring manual just, just gives us this waveform shape. Uh, the monophasic and polyphasic uh, K-complexes really are not distinguished uh, in, in current terminology. Okay. Can you have sleep spindles during REM sleep? Um, that's also a good question. And, and uh, you know, certainly you can have alpha rhythm during uh, stage R sleep. Uh, and if that occurs in the absence of, of a, uh, an increase in the EMG, it's not considered an arousal. Uh, but sleep spindles do indicate the presence of, of stage N2 sleep. Uh, and if there's a... a more than half of an epoch uh, where there's sleep spindles and no eye movements, uh, that would be considered uh, a stage N2 sleep. So that would end uh, stage R sleep. Okay. And, and we'll get to that in, in July. When you have a waveform that appears to be a slow wave, but you have, let's say, high frequency superimposed on the slow wave, can you comment on the what this, what's part of your decision-making process in assessing whether or not that is a slow wave uh, waveform or a high frequency? Yeah, and that does happen when you, you have spindle activity, for example, riding on, on a slow wave. Um, I think what needs to be done is what's done mathematically when, when a fast Fourier transform is, is um, performed, which is to break out the frequency components of the waveform uh, into the separate frequency bands. Uh, and there, visually, you just have to look at the underlying waveform to see if, if the slow wave activity is there. Now, one way of doing this is to, to use the zero crossing method, which really, uh, you know, if the, the faster activity is, is smaller in amplitude, it, it sort of uh, accounts for that in, in terms of measuring the duration. Uh, but uh, in terms of calling it a slow wave, you really just have to uh, um, visually de decompress the activity into its very various components and look at the underlying slow wave and try to erase the faster frequency waveform uh, on top of that. You can do this in an analog, uh, actually in a digital filter uh, uh, methodology uh, by uh, decreasing the high frequency filter so that you can filter out the, the faster waveform. Uh, I don't recommend this as a method for scoring because uh, changing the filter settings uh, will distort the waveform. But it can give you an idea of what you're looking at in a, in a little more detail. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Can you explain what a Prozac I is? This is in quotes, Prozac I. Yeah, it is in quotes, and, and it's not something that, that's well established as, as something that happens. But I think most people who have seen patients who are taking Prozac or, or any other uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor and any other SSRI will notice that there are fast eye movements uh, that occur in all stages of sleep. So you can see that prominently in, in sleep onset and in stage N2 sleep. Um, these are not considered uh, rapid eye movements of REM sleep, and it's often very difficult to distinguish between the two. Uh, so in patients who are taking these medications, it can be more difficult to, to determine sleep stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this appears to be the last question. I have read that the K in the K complex stands for knuckle or knock. Can you, <laughs> have you heard of that? <laughs> uh, as I say in our three month long discussion on, on yeah. sleep L, uh, that did come up as, as part of the possibility. And, and as I say, I, I think at the end of all of this discussion, uh, the conclusion was that, that no one was really sure about it. Uh, what the origin of the term actually is. Mm 
Um, and one more thing, I, I did get a message from Claude Albertario, who listened to my talk uh, extremely carefully and pointed out that I made a mistake uh, in saying that the overlap between spindles and alpha rhythm activity was 13 to 16 hertz. Uh, he's absolutely correct. The overlapping frequency is 11 to 13 hertz. All right. Okay. So that was an error I'd like to correct. Sure. The uh, Just a little quick anecdote on the knuckle or knock. I remember years ago someone was te trying to teach me what a K-complex was, and there was a patient uh, asleep, and they did a little knock, just a small knock with their knuckle on the door, uh, mm -hmm. because apparently that evoked a K-complex, and it, it, it actually did. <laughs> but, uh, again, that's completely uh, anecdotal. Okay. That appears to be all of the questions. I want to take this opportunity to thank you once again for taking your time today, Dr. Rosenberg. This session, like again, was, was, was excellent, and there are many positive comments here, and a lot of people really learned a lot today. We look forward to, to seeing you again virtually in July. Will you be at the ABSS this year? Uh, absolutely, uh, and all of us at the, in the staff for the academy will be wearing red shirts, so I'll mm -hmm. be easy to recognize. All right, great. Well, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you there. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, so thank you once again, everyone. Again, if you have any questions, my contact information is there. I look forward to uh, to seeing you again virtually, and if you're planning on attending the ADS Fest this year, I hope to have an opportunity to meet you. I will be at the NATIS booth. So thanks again, everyone. Take care and have a great weekend. Bye for now.